ma Yesu malomwa tu anapachi kidwa tu anamnyoza pansi pano wenzi lao chimwao ulemele center of excellence for Reformed Biblical Scholarship, devotion, and teaching, impacting Africa with the gospel of Christ and a God-centered worldview. And really that, that encapsulates and undergirds everything that we're about. We want to be very clear about both academic excellence and evangelistic fervor. We want to be clear about the about uniting the, the head, the hands, and the heart. That's the vision of ACU as a whole, and it is most assuredly the vision of the School of Divinity. The, the other thing that's important, Divinity, as part of ACU, that's why we chose to be School of Divinity as opposed to a seminary. And everybody keeps using the term seminary, seminary, seminary. And when we started, that's what we talked about. But a seminary is a standalone institution. A school of divinity is part of the broader university. So we're not separate from ACU. 
we're not other than ACU. Um, we are an arm of ACU. We are intricately, we are intricately involved and ingrained in the ethos. When you talk about universities going adrift, there are a couple of things that happen that lead to that. One is you separate the university from the church. When you look at the great universities and the, the Harvards of the world and Princetons of the world, the first step in their theological and moral decline is that you divorce their work from the church. And you divorce it from the accountability of the church and you divorce it from the influence of the church. The second thing you do is you divorce the school of divinity from the broader university. And so now all of a sudden, you, you have this bifurcated view of education and, and you know business and agriculture, or the sciences or whatever, it, it's over here. And the matter of theology and theological education belongs over here, which facilitates that downward decline of the university over and against the school of divinity or the seminary. And because they're both divorced from the church, eventually the decline happens in both places. And that is almost universally true of early theological institutions. When you look, for example, at the Ivy Leagues, um, the universities are And even as he speaks, he will speak with all clarity, with all boldness, and he will speak as he ought to speak. For us who are here, as oh God our Father, wouldn't you also enable us by opening our hearts to receive the truths that we would engage with this morning? May it please you to bless our time together and undertake for us, take away distractions and take away anything that will disrupt our communion with you. In your word this morning be with us oh god our father we pray we ask these things not because of our own abilities not because of our own strength but because of our lord and savior jesus christ whose perfect work has made it possible for us to enjoy this great moment with you so bless us we pray in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen, amen. would like i mentioned earlier on uh First session this morning would be on growing in our understanding of doctrine. Uh, and the teachings will actually come from 1 Timothy 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. Our preacher, our speaker this morning is Pastor Mark Rains, and he will be walking us through this teaching as well. I'll encourage everyone to be uh, to pay close attention to the things we will hear and to also note questions. If you do have questions along the line, please note them down in the course or at the end of the teaching, we will have some time to hear those questions. And time permitting us, we could hear some comments and um, contributions as well. So I encourage us to indeed engage our ears here this morning even as we prepare our hearts to receive God's word. Uh, to prepare ourselves, we would sing together from the Great Hymns 674. And it's our uh, asking the Lord to teach us His way. 674 Great Hymns, may we all rise together as we sing uh, this song together and prepare to receive God's word. They're, they're, they're different tunes, so they're trying to work that out. It can be teach me thy way. You can sing that. Teach me thy way. Teach me thy 
See you all again. Looking at the subject this morning of growing our understanding of doctrine. Going to look at a couple of passages from the first letter to Timothy, chapters one and four. Although we won't be uh, exegeting those passages specifically, we're going to be moving around a number of different texts. But uh, just to uh, prepare us for that, let's read together one Timothy chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Saviour, and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, the ungodly and for sinners, the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. 
This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by then you may wage the good warfare, and having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Then we turn over to chapter 4. <coughs> Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. <clears throat> for every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. For well, bodily exercise profits a little, godliness is profit profitable for all things, <clears throat> having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. <clears throat> this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, but to this end we both labour and suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God, who is the Saviour of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to, evident to all. <clears throat> Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Amen. Let's ask for God's blessing on our time in his word. <clears throat> Heavenly Father and gracious God, we again turn to you and we thank you for your kindness, your goodness, in which you have brought us together this morning, that you have rested us during the night and given us this uh, great privilege of being together for a time of conference and fellowship together. Thank you for the light of your word. Thank you that we may live in the light of it, that it is a lamp to our path and a light to our feet. We thank you, Lord, that we can rest the weight of our souls on this trustworthy word. And so we pray now as we come to study this and think about the whole matter of Christian doctrine, that, Lord, you would give help, that you would give us understanding, that you would give us a deeper, deeper appreciation for the word and for its truths, and that you would enable us to work these into our lives, that we may uh, serve you and glorify you with the strength that you supply. Lord, please, would you help us this morning in preaching and help us to hear. Lord, may we not be as that man who uh, went into the, the mirror and looked at uh, his reflection and walked away and forgot what manner of man he was. Lord, help us to see ourselves in the Word and to go away and to be changed and to have a resolve to live according to your truth. Please, O oh Lord, help us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs> There's a uh, cartoon series that's run in many of the uh, American daily papers for a number of years, and uh, it was devised by a Lutheran called Charles Schultz, and it's called Peanuts. Peanuts, uh, you may have heard of it, it's Charlie Brown and so on. And there was one of these cartoons one time, and it has a couple of the main characters, Sally and Linus, and they're sitting, looking out the window, <clears throat> and it's raining, it's raining very hard, and Sally says, wow, look how hard it's raining, I hope it doesn't flood the whole world. And Linus, who's sitting next to us, says, no, it can never do that, because God has promised that that would never happen. Oh, she said, that takes a big load off my mind. And Linus says, yep, sound theology does that. And that's true, isn't it? Sound theology, good doctrine, it has a way of doing that, of guarding us, of keeping us from falling into error, like that on the one hand, and also promoting and giving rise to spiritual health and fruitfulness in our Christian lives on the other. Sound theology, good doctrine, has a way of doing that. 
And so that's one of the reasons why we as believers, if we are here, uh, believers here this morning, we ought to be those who are actively, consciously seeking to grow in our understanding and knowledge of doctrine. And if, by God's grace, we already have a good understanding of doctrine, then we should be seeking to make sure that we don't actually lose that. I mentioned yesterday Philip Reich, and he was the minister at 10th Presbyterian in Philadelphia, and uh, he has a commentary on uh, 1 Timothy, and in that he relates a book that his father gave to him when he was a young man, he was about to go away to college, and before he set off, his father gave him a copy of Louis Burkhoff's Manual of Christian Doctrine. It's a small classic summary of Reformed theology, and inside the cover he wrote, For Philip, upon entering college in the hope that your theology will remain reformed. So there was a foundation there already, and he didn't want him to lose it, but rather to continue to grow and to build on it. Because understanding doctrine and growing in our knowledge of doctrine is something very important. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking that it isn't these days. Uh, looking out at the church in general, uh, there seems to be very little in some churches by way of doctrine, almost a distaste, it seems, in some churches for preaching that contains doctrine. And instead, there is now an emphasis more on feelings and worship that's designed to be entertaining and so on and so forth with less and less time for preaching or if there is preaching the preaching that there is tends to be more of a spiritual pep talk than any real exposition of the word or teaching of doctrine because doctrine is seen by many as being dry dusty uh, cerebral only for academics only for the scholars to debate over up there in their ivory towers that's the way many people, sadly, view a subject like this. And so what we want to do this morning is to see, perhaps for the first time, or and I think for many of you this is just a reminder, you're already convinced of these things, to remind ourselves of the vital importance of doctrine. The vital importance of having a really good grasp of doctrine that we be seeking always to grow to grow and advance in our understanding of doctrine. That's what we want to do this morning. It's a sort of a topical study, I suppose we could call this. It's not so much an exposition of any one particular text, but as I mentioned, we're just going to move around a few texts as we consider this subject of Christian doctrine, the what, the why, and the how. The what, the why, and the how of growing in our understanding of doctrine. That's what we want to do this morning. So let's begin then with that question, a simple one, just by way of introduction. The what? What is doctrine? What do we mean when we use the term doctrine? What is it that we are referring to? According to the dictionary, the English word doctrine comes from the Latin word docere, meaning to teach, or doctor, a related word meaning teacher. So that's what doctrine is basically in its simplest form. It's teaching. And the Greek words also, didache and didaskalia, they have the same meaning. Didache means teaching, didaskalia means instruction. And in the Bible, when we see those words, they're both used in that way to refer either to the act of teaching or to the content of the teaching itself. Um, Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word, he says, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Did okay? Doctrine. Verse 3 For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Didascalia. Teaching. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. So that's the way those words are used there and in about 50 other places. As well, in the New Testament, to refer to teaching, biblical, scriptural teaching, whether that's read, whether it's explained or summarized as well. That's how the word can be used to refer to a, a body of teaching, a summary, a synthesis of the Bible's teaching on a particular subject. We, um, we talk, don't we, sometimes about individual doctrines, the doctrine of the atonement for example, what is that? What do we mean by that? Well, what we're referring to is a summary, a condensing down of all the Bible's teaching on that particular subject, drawing upon all the different scriptural passages that deal with things like sin and the way that God has been pointed for the forgiveness of sin, going all the way back to the Old Testament and to the sacrificial system and then moving forward into the New Testament and the way that those things have been po uh, were pointed to and have been fulfilled in the death of Christ at the cross. 
that's what doctrine is. It's sort of pulling together, summarizing, systematizing those truths and distilling it all down into what we gather under that umbrella term of doctrine. Now, the Puritans, <clears throat> they would do that in their sermons. They uh, would uh, preach on a particular subject. They would survey a number of texts and passages. And then after they'd done that, they would have a section called the Doctrine where they would distill it all down, the teaching of all of those passages and texts into summary form, and they would call that the doctrine. And so that's what we're talking about here when we use the word doctrine. It's that summary, that distillation of the Bible's teaching on a particular subject or thing. So that's our first point this morning. We're not going to spend long on that. It's just really a way of introduction. I think many, many of you here, you're very familiar with this. And so I don't think we need to spend too long on that. That's the what, what doctrine is. Let's spend more time now thinking about the why. Why is it that we need to be growing in our understanding of doctrine? That's perhaps an area where more uh, people can struggle these days, isn't it? Why, you know, why do we need doctrine? Many people say, don't they? You, you know, just give me the practical stuff. Just give me the how-to stuff, isn't it? You know, just, just, I don't want the doctrine. Just tell me what it is I need to do. That's what people can say today, isn't it? So let's think about that. Why, why do we need to grow in our understanding of doctrine? We've got four things here that I want you to think about. First is, helps us with life's priority. It helps us with life's priority. What is life's priority? Well, we know that because our Lord tells us in Matthew 22, verse 37, <clears throat> Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's life's priority. It's our number one priority. It's our uh, raison d'etre. It's our reason for being to love and glorify God. And so if you love someone, <clears throat> if you truly love someone, then you want to find out about them, don't you? Imagine a young man. He falls in love with a young lady. What happens? He, he wants to know all about her. He, he's, he's asking questions. He wants to know where she's from. He wants to know her family. He wants to know what school she went to. He wants to know what pastime she has. He wants to know uh, what her favourite food is and all of these kind of things. If you love someone, you want to know as much as you can about them. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. If we love God, we want to be growing and increasing in our knowledge of Him, learning as much as we can about Him, His nature, His character, His commandments, His plans and purposes in this world. All of those kind of things we want to learn more and more about Him with the view in growing in our love for Him. Because that's what happens, isn't it? As we learn about him, we begin to grow more and more in love for him. As we learn about the, the, the Trinity, for example, and how God is one in essence, but exists in three persons who've dwelt in that relationship of perfect love for all eternity. And it's out of the overflow of that love that God created the world and determined to save a people for himself. As we learn more and more about that, we're filled, aren't we? We're filled with love to God as our creator. And also, as we learn how out of that love, he sent his son to accomplish our salvation by his perfect life and by his atoning death. And how he then sent his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to apply that saving work to our lives. Then we're also filled with love to him as our Redeemer as well. And so it's doctrine. You see, it's good, sound Christian doctrine that does that. It teaches us that. So that we love him. And also, as we learn about how salvation is all God's work, that we contributed nothing to it, nothing but the sin, and that God saved us all according to his mercy and grace, and even faith itself was something he created in our hearts. As we learn about these doctrines, the doctrines of grace, we call them, that leads us to love and wonder and gratitude, doesn't it? Gratitude and also worship. Leads us to worship, doesn't it? You see that in uh, Romans, for example, isn't it? Where we're privileged to be going through Romans uh, during this conference. And you see that in the book of Romans, don't you? Paul, in the, uh, the first section of the book there, he lays out the work of God on our behalf, sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to deliver us from the dominion, the bondage of sin, to give us spiritual union with Jesus Christ so that we can walk with him in this life and we can be with him for all eternity. Uh, Paul lays it out, does it, in the, the opening 11 chapters. We have that doctrine set forth. And then you get to the end of chapter 11 and you get those three verses is at the end there 33 to 36 and it's as if Paul having done all of that he 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 puts his pen down and he just sits back and he says oh the, oh the depth 
of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways and his judgments past finding out. The doctrine, you see, has had that effect upon him. All that he knows about God, the plans and purposes of God to save us from our sins and to bring us to be with God for all eternity. As he thinks about that, he just worships. He breaks out in expressions of heartfelt, fervent praise. That's what doctrine does. It leads to that. Good doctrine leads to that. Um, there's a, a good systematic theology that uh, Dr. Joel Beakey has brought out and an uh, excellent but wonderful book to read, beautifully uh, written and, and produced. And uh, in, in this systematic theology, he goes through the doctrine in each chapter. And then after that, he'll give the applications. And, and at the end of the applications, then you get a hymn. Right at the very end, you get a hymn or a, 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 a selection from a metrical psalm. There's an expression of praise to God, you see, in response to what's just been set forth. It leads to, to praise. It leads to worship and, and doctrine. Good, sound doctrine does that. So that's the first thing here. That we're thinking about the why. The why of Christian doctrine, why we should study it. That's the first thing. It helps us with life's priority, which is loving and worshipping God. Secondly, it helps to keep us in the way of spiritual safety. Spiritual health and safety, we might say. There, there was an exam at a Christian school one time, and the teacher asked the class a question, what is false doctrine? And a boy in the class mistakenly thought she said, doctoring. And so he raised his hand and said, it's when the doctor gives the wrong stuff to people who are sick. That's false doctoring. Well, that, that wasn't the answer that she was looking for, but there is a sense in which... He's not far off there, actually, because we do live in a sin-sick world. And so those who teach false doctrine, what they are in essence doing is they're giving the wrong stuff to people who are sick. Do good doctrine, however, by contrast, promotes health. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 again, Paul says there, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine there. That word sound is an interesting word. From it we get our English word hy hygienic. Hygienic. Healthy, clean, promoting health. Sound doctrine. That's what sound doctrine does. It promotes clean, healthy, sound living. False teaching, false doctrine, by contrast, it undermines spiritual health. It breaks down, it destroys spiritual health. And because of that, that's the way the devil the enemy of souls uses it and those who spread it. Uh, Romans 16, verse 17, I urge you, brethren, Paul says, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Or again, in Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 2, Verses 16 to 18, he says a similar thing. Avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. So false teachers then going about spreading false doctrine. What does it do? What's the effect? It attacks and breaks down, and it undermines spiritual health. And so God's people then, uh, especially the leaders of God's people, they need to be able to recognize it and discern it in order to protect God's people from falling into it. That's one of the primary qualifications of an, uh, of an elder. Paul says that, doesn't he, to Titus there in chapter 1. He lays out a number of the other requirements for the office of an elder. And one of the final uh, climactic things he says there in that section, chapter 1, verse 9, is that he, he's talking there about a faithful elder, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. So he is to, to promote healthy, uh, sound teaching. He must be able to do that. And also, he says, to rebuke those who contradict it. So he's got to be able to recognize and discern false teaching when it comes along and, and be able to resist it. He says a similar thing to Timothy as well. Um, this is in uh, his first letter to Timothy, as we read through. You can see this very strong instruction on this theme of guarding and protecting the church against false doctrine. As I urged you, chapter 4, verse 1, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was the center of Paul's church 
planting strategy for Asia Minor. He visited the city, stayed for more than two years of extended teaching there, and then he left Timothy in charge before sometime later, after a second visit there, he writes him a letter. It's his first letter. And he tells him there, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. A different doctrine. Uh, we see that in some of Paul's letters, how he condemns those who preach a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different spirit, a different doctrine. That's false doctrine. And that was the problem in Ephesus. There were false teachers promoting false doctrine. We don't know exactly who they are. Uh, Paul didn't name them. He simply refers to them as certain persons. Probably Timothy knew who they were, and they were spreading false teaching. Chapter 1 makes reference to this. Remain in Ephesus, he says, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. So that was the focus of these men. It was on myths and genealogies, probably referring, the scholars think here, to the teaching of some Jewish rabbis who used ancient texts, such as the Book of Jubilees. Um, one commentator says, They started with the Bible and made up the rest as they went along. Their teaching was little more than guesswork, the product of a lively imagination. Then as now, such speculative theories were likely to excite the interest of weak or unsound hearers. So that's what happens. Their teaching leads people astray. And Paul knew that. He knew the danger of that. He knew the danger of that there in Ephesus. Uh, if you remember... In his farewell speech to the elders on the beach, there he said, I know after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men, speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. In his uh, second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, 7 through 10, he speaks of those who are sort of like spiritual hucksters, we might say, spiritual charlatans, peddlers of false religion. They have the ability to dupe and to deceive, the ability to get in and lead some of the the uh, less well-taught women folk astray. <clears throat> and so that's what false teachers do. That's what false doctrine does. It undermines spiritual health and causes people to go astray. And so the job of the faithful shepherd then, for his part, is to be always on the lookout for such teaching. He's to be like a watchman on the walls, always looking for the approach of the enemy or a uh, shepherd out in the field, very vigilant, always looking for wolves who might be seeking to get in among the flock. You know, that's the kind of language and the terminology the, the Bible uses, isn't it? Or if we were to use the analogy of spiritual health, a church leader or church elder needs to be not only a watchman and a shepherd, but also we could say a good physician, one who's trained and skilled, able to discern, discern any signs of ill health, Sound doctrine promotes health. False doctrine undermines health. So he's got to be able to notice the symptoms as they begin to appear. Uh, I have a brother in our church, and I was talking to him a while ago, and he was telling me how he'd been working outside one day, and uh, he came in, and in the evening he noticed he had a rash beginning to develop on his back. And uh, so he thought he'd been bitten, thought he'd been stung, or maybe something like that, and uh, didn't really think much of it. And then he was having a phone conversation with his son later in the evening, and his son happened to be in the medical profession. He just mentioned this in passing. So his son began to ask him a number of questions over the phone, and began to diagnose, and he said, Dad, you need to get to the hospital right away. And it turned out he had shingles. But his son was able to diagnose that just by hearing some of the symptoms. He could recognize this was something serious. This was something that could really undermine his health. He spotted it. And church leaders need to be able to do that <clears throat> because there are, a lot, there are a lot of sort of spiritual bugs and viruses out there these days, which if you get into your system can really be detrimental to your spiritual health. Not just thinking about all the different types of cults there are out there, but even within Christendom, there are various strains of teaching, which if a person gets into his or her system can really rob you of joy and peace and usefulness in your Christian life. Health, wealth and prosperity teaching, just to give an example. I mean, how many believers there are in different parts of the world who've been infected with that? And as a result, all the negative sort of effects that that's had on their spiritual life. And so the point we're making here is the faithful minister and church leader, he always needs to have his, his antenna up for that. Um... You know the the, uh, the Norton antivirus software. If you have a computer, 
and you ever tried to turn your antivirus software on, there used to be a little pop-up that would come on the screen. It says, we strongly advise that you keep this on. Your antivirus software. Well, in the spiritual realm, in the church, you, you need to keep your antivirus software on. You need to always be alert and aware of this. But not just ministers, not just thinking of pastors and preachers here, church members as well. Because remember what Paul says to Timothy. He says to Timothy, you're to be an example of these things to the flock. And so if Timothy is to exemplify these things, that means to be a role model, then what that means really is that the rest of God's people in the church are also to have some measure of competency in this as well. We're all, as Jude says, we're all to contend, earnestly contend for the faith, strive for it, fight for it, defend it. And so to do that, to be able to do that, you've got to know what it is that you're defending. You've got to do a bit better than the man George Whitfield once met. You know, George Whitfield was the great uh, evangelist of the, uh, the times, the Great Awakening in the uh, 1700s. And he one time met a man and uh, during the course of their conversation, he said to him, Sir, what do you believe? And the man said, I believe what my church believes. And what does your church believe? Said Whitfield, the same thing I believe. And what do you both believe then? Oh, we believe the same thing. Well, you know, I mean, we haven't all got to be Charles Hodge. We haven't all got to be Louis Burkhoff or R.C. Sproul or anything like that. But we've got to do a bit better than that. We've got to be growing in our understanding of doctrine. Because, as we've said, helps promote spiritual health and safety. Helps us with life's priority. A third thing to think about this morning helps us to cope with and process life's adversity. Because it's actually doctrine and what you believe that will shape your spiritual life. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. It says in Proverbs, what you know about God and the way that you think about God is going to affect the way that you believe. If you don't believe in or understand the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, it's difficult really to appreciate the nature of God himself, that God is love. But when you know what the Bible teaches about the Trinity, the three persons of the Godhead dwelling there in that relationship of perfect love, out of which the three of them were involved in the creation of the world and also the redemption of his people to bring his people into that relationship of love with them, then you begin to see that love is in the nature of God and all that happens to us in this world as believers. Nothing, nothing, nothing will ever separate us from that love. So that's doctrine, isn't it? Doctrine that teaches us that. The doctrine of God and then also the doctrine of providence as well. The doctrine of providence, the doctrine of God's sovereignty too. You uh, think about how he uh, orders all things after the counsel of his own will, that he rules among the armies of the heavens. There's none who can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? And when you know that that rule extends even to the smallest events in life, to a sparrow falling to the ground, to the numbering of the hairs on your head, you know, that starts to bring peace. That helps you as you go through life. B.B. Warfield says there is nothing, there is nothing that is, nothing that comes to pass that God has not first decreed and then brought to pass by his creation or providence. And so when you know that, when you know that he does all things for his glory and for the good of his own people, what does that do? It gives you a foundation, doesn't it? It gives you a foundation to your life. When you've got that kind of teaching stored away. Um, think about this, the Heidelberg Catechism, its paragraph on providence. Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. What a beautiful statement that is. When you know that, when you've got that sort of doctrine stored away in your soul, then you can be calm. Then you can be at peace, even amidst the storm. It's like having ballast ballast stored away in the ship you know what i mean by that um where i come from over in the uh, the east coast of the united states you can go north of where i am up to plymouth and that's where the uh, the pilgrims the english pilgrims who landed over on the shores of the new world they they settled there in that region and there it was the uh, the mayflower ship perhaps some of you heard of it and if you go to plymouth there's a replica of the mayflower there and you can go down into the hold of the mayflower 
And you'll see all these barrels there, these round oak barrels, which when the pilgrims set off from England, they filled with drinking water. And uh, as they used the, the water for drinking and for cooking, and the barrels were empty, they filled them with seawater. Not to drink, of course, but because those barrels performed a second function, they were ballast down there in the ship. That heavy weight in the lower part of the ship to give it stability so that once it gets out to the seas and starts hitting rough seas and stormy weather, it doesn't capsize, it doesn't go under, it doesn't cut getting blown this way and that because it's got this heavy weight of ballast down there in the hold of the ship. And that's what doctrine does. Doctrine, we store it away in our hearts and minds so that when the rough seas of life come, when the storms start to blow in your life, because they will, the storms are coming, if you haven't already encountered them, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. It's inevitable. It's inescapable. There's trouble. There are going to be storms in life. And if you haven't got ballast in the ship, if you haven't got heavy weight down there, you're going to get blown about this way and that. But when there's teaching, you see, sound teaching, sound doctrine stored away in the soul, then there's stability. Then there's calmness. Then there's a peace, even through the greatest of storms. Um, think about John Calvin in this regard, at the death of his infant son, his only child. What a storm that was to go through, to lose his infant son. And, of course, Calvin was a man with such tremendous understanding of doctrine. He had so much ballast sort of away there, didn't he? And so in the midst of that storm, he could say this, the Lord has certainly inflicted a severe and bitter wound in the death of our infant son, but... He is himself a father and knows best what is good for his children. Mm. Kept him calm. Kept him at peace. Kept him afloat amidst the storm. The doctrine of God's providence and sovereignty stored away in his mind. You, know, you can be calm then. You can be at peace. You can be cheerful even. Somebody in our church was asking me recently for a book that they could uh, give to somebody who was uh, battling with cancer. And I recommended Earl Blackburn's book. It was produced by Reformation Heritage Book a couple of years ago, uh, Honouring Christ When Fighting Cancer. And uh, it's based on Earl's own experience. I don't know if you know Earl Blackburn. He's a man who's been a pastor for many years. And uh, years and years of sound doctrine stored away there. But then he came into one of life's storms, a big storm. He was suddenly diagnosed with advanced bowel cancer. And he came close to death a couple of times, went through some very grueling chemotherapy treatments uh, but then he wrote a book out of his experience there to help people going through that and he gives counsels one of the counsels that he gives in that book is try to remain cheerful try to remain cheerful based on proverbs 17 verse 22 a merry heart does good like medicine and uh, he related an incident from his own experience he said two months into chemo treatments my oncologist sent me to my gastroenterologist for a checkup Providentially, I met him in the hallway leading to his office. He's about six, foot, six, six inches tall and is from Brooklyn, New York. When he saw me, he hugged me, stood back, put both hands on my shoulders and in a sympathetic tone said, I've heard you've been through a really tough time. How much of your colon did Dr. Doy's, uh, Roy, Roy's remove? I replied, the first surgery he removed 20%. The third surgery he removed an additional 15%. Then I added, I no longer have a colon. He gave me a puzzled look and firmly said, yes, you do. I said, no, sir, I don't. With a stern look, speaking in his heavy Brooklyn accent, he asserted, Yes, you do. You have 65% left. I'm your doctor. I know. To which I replied, No, sir, I don't. Most people have a colon. I once had one, but now I have a semicolon. If it gets down to a comma, I'm going to get nervous. And if it gets down to a full stop, I'm going to be really sweaty. <laughs> so yeah, there he is in the midst of one of life's storms, one of the biggest storms that you can imagine. And yet in the midst of it all, he's got this quiet, trusting, cheerful spirit. A merry heart does good, like medicine. So how do you do that? I mean, how do you get that? Well, it's the grace of God, of course. But also, it's the ballast. He's got the ballast of sound doctrine stored away below. Doctrine, you see, knowing, growing in our understanding, it does this. It helps us with life's priority. It promotes spiritual health and safety, helps us to cope with life's adversity. A final thing here, it promotes spiritual activity. It promotes spiritual activity. That's the biblical pattern. Doctrine leads to activity. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, first of all, isn't it? 
Then for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? What's the reason? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that's the way. That's the biblical order, isn't it? Doctrine leads to being equipped. Doctrine leads to activity and ministry. You find that, don't you, in Paul's letters, so many of them, the great doctrinal epistles, for example. That's the order. It's doctrine first, and then application and exhortation that comes out of that. Uh, the book of Ephesians, for example, you get three chapters of teaching, and then chapter four, you get the, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy. Galatians 2, four chapters of doctrine, then you come to chapter five, therefore, stand fast. Colossians, the same thing. Book of Romans, of course, classic example. That's a book that can be divided into two main sections. First 11 chapters, you have the instruction. And then the second smaller section, 12 through 16, gives us the application. So first half is the doctrine, second half is the duty. First half is the indicatives, second half is the imperatives. That's gospel grammar, isn't it? Indicatives before imperatives. First he tells us what God has done for us, and then he tells us what we know are to do in response to that. And so you've got to have those two things joined together. You need them both. You need doctrine for the mind... You need that, don't you? We've been saying that. You need to have truth there, being processed by the mind. But it doesn't just want to stay there in the mind. It's got to get worked out in the life. So it goes from the mind down to the heart and then out in the hands and feet. And so that's what you have when you come to Romans chapter 12. You get that little connecting word at the beginning of that section. You get that therefore, don't you? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He's now moving into activities, giving you the doctrine. This is now what you are to do. That word, therefore, it's like a little bridge that connects uh, two continents, isn't it? Imagine uh, you go to the uh, westernmost tip of Alaska, and there was a bridge that connected you to the westernmost tip of Russia. Uh, bridge to connect the two well that's what that word therefore really does it connects those two great continents the first one of chapters 1 through 11 of the doctrine and then it's connected by that therefore to the other continent of chapters 12 through 16 which is the duty it's the activity it's the application so doctrine then leads to activity you need that therefore to connect the two there needs to be a therefore you need a therefore in your christian life it's no good just having it all stored away in your mind. It needs to be worked out. It needs to go from there out into your life. Doctrine for life. You know, I mentioned Dr. Beakey's uh, systematic theology. He also has a blog. don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to check that out. But uh, his blog has that title, Doctrine for Life. That's what it's intended to do, to promote activity. There was another professor at the seminary, also had a, blo a blog, uh, Dr. David Murray, excellent blog as well, highly recommend it. And that was called Head, Heart, Hands. That's the journey it's got to make, from the head, down to the heart, and then out into the life with our hands and feet and the way we live. That's what doctrine does. It leads to practical Christian living. And so we're thinking here, aren't we, about the importance of growing in our understanding of doctrine. It helps us with life's priority, keeps us in spiritual safety, helps us to process life's adversity, and promotes spiritual activity. We've looked at the what and the why. Let's finally look at the how. Three things to think about here. Sure, this is very familiar to many of you, but to remind us for you. Uh, firstly, by reading. I was at a family camp uh, back uh, a, few, a few months ago in the summer and uh, noticed that some of the sessions, the elders, before each session, they would take opportunity to recommend to the group there one or two books which they had found helpful. And uh, such a good thing to do because never in the history of the Christian church have there been so many good books available. Beautiful books. Such well-written books, beautifully produced. So many books available, many Many wonderful books on systematic theology, you know, the classics, Hodge, uh, also by Burkhoff. There are small introductions, uh, Burkhoff's manual on systematic theology, Thomas Watson's Body of Divinity. And then also, of course, we have uh, the benefit of 
doctrine handed down to us, whole bodies of teaching passed down, the, the confessions, the Westminster Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and of course our own 1689 Baptist Confession, and these documents are so helpful for giving us an ordered, summarized, uh, systematized summary of the things most assuredly believed, but also many of those confessions were actually hammered out and forged in an atmosphere when error and heresy and false teaching was rampant and rife. And so many of those confessions, they were actually written as a direct response to many of those errors that were abroad at that time and which can come against us in modernized forms today. And so what a blessing then, what, what a spiritual boon for us to have access to these documents. And so read, isn't it? I'm sure most of you already have, we do. Read the 1689. If you haven't already, begin and start to work through it. Get an exposition of it. Now, there's a wonderful new one coming out. Um, Pastor Rob Ventura is the editor of it. A beautiful new exposition of the 1689 Confession of Faith with each chapter expounded by a different Reformed Baptist pastor from uh, over there in the States. It's a beautiful book. It's going to be a wonderful resource for the church. So read. That, that's the point I'm making. Read. To grow in knowledge of doctrine, try to make time to do some reading. It's not always easy. I know we have very busy lives these days. It can be difficult to make time for reading. But if there's a heart for it, if there's intentionality there, you can. I think it was John Piper once said that um, if you were to read for just 15 minutes a day, even if you're a slow reader, you can, during the course of a year, if you keep that up, you can read about, I think he said 20 books. 20 books in the course of a year. And if some of those are good, sound, theological works, think of all the ballast you're storing away down there in your soul. So, reading. Um, we mentioned yesterday, didn't we, Paul? Paul, there he is in prison. You know, he wants the scrolls, he wants the parchments. He's a man who's written so much of the New Testament. He's planted churches all over the place and he wants the scrolls. Paul, don't you know this stuff? No, no, he wants the scrolls. He wants to, to be reading and learning. Spurgeon has got a great sermon on that passage. Uh, he says this of Paul. The apostle says to Timothy, and so he says to every preacher, give yourself unto reading. The man who never reads will never be read. He who never quotes will never be quoted. He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves he has no brains of his own. Brethren, what is true of ministers is true of all our people. You need to read. Renounce as much as you will all light literature, but study as much as possible sound theological works, especially the Puritan writers and expositions of the Bible. We are quite persuaded the very best way for you to be spending your leisure is to be either reading or praying. You may get much instruction from books, which afterwards you may use as a true weapon in your Lord and Master's service. Paul cries, bring the books, join in the cry. And so that's a first thing to consider. How to grow in our knowledge of doctrine, reading. Secondly, listening to preaching. Listening to preaching. Because don't you think there's a connection? I mean, I can't prove this. This is just a, my own personal theory. But don't you think that there is a connection between the rise of cults and so much false doctrine and false teaching ministries that seem to have sprung up in the last 20 to 30 years. Don't you think there's a connection between that and at the same time the widespread abandonment of the evening service in many so-called orthodox Christian churches? Maybe that's not happening here, but certainly it's happening over in the States. Because think about what's happened there. At a stroke, by removing that service, what you've done is you've reduced the spiritual intake of God's people by 50%. Just like that. And so is it any wonder then? That God's people can start to flounder? Is it any wonder they can start to fall into theological error when they've reduced their spiritual intake in half? I mean, can, can you really get by on one sermon a week? Can you? When you think about all the hours you spend out there in the world, 100 plus hours a week and all the noise, all the information, the music, the movies, the conversation, the chatter that your mind is processing, 100 plus hours a week and you come in to church on Sunday morning for 40 minutes? You sure that's enough? We need to be listening to preaching. 
And so making sure we are all the stated meetings of the church and then supplementing if you're able. I mean, so many resources these days, aren't there, on our phones and computers. We can download from some of the good websites, Ligonier and church websites, downloading sermons and this kind of thing. Supplementing in that way, reading good books, listening to preaching. And most of all, of course, being in the word, making time every day to study the word, asking for God's help to understand and to grow in our knowledge of the word. We have the help of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't reveal new truth to us, but he illumines the truth that we have here. And so we need to be in his word every day, seeking understanding, praying with the psalmist, O Lord, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your law. That's the application for us if we're believers here this morning. If you're not a Christian, I don't know if there are any here this morning, maybe some uh, non-Christian friends here this morning. I want to encourage you. You're perhaps thinking, what is all this about? What am I supposed to get from all of this this morning? I want to encourage you to start to read the Bible. You must start to read the Bible. The scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. You need to be saved. You need to be saved. Time is running out. We're hurtling towards that open-ended encounter that we're going to have with the living God on Judgment Day. You need to be saved. And the Bible is able to make you wise unto salvation. The salvation which comes only by faith in Jesus Christ and you can come to him by reading the Bible read the Word of God it will bring you to him this is a book that understands you it understands your condition I just want to finish by telling you about a professor from Princeton Seminary in the last century his name was Dr. Emile Callier and as a young man he was a total unbeliever uh, a real avowed atheist and uh, he went to fight for the French in World War One and for him the, the, the human suffering that he saw all around him just confirmed for him he believed that there was nothing really in religion that could help him uh, but at the same time he longed to have something that could really minister to his soul and so what he did was he, he put together a little notebook of any things that he read any sentences he picked up from his reading that helped him and ministered to him in some way he put this into a little book which he called the book that understands me it was his own sort of manual of doctrine if you like well he survived uh, the world war one and he came through even though he was injured and at the end of that, that time he got out this little book that he put together the book that understands me and he read it and as he began to read through it, his heart sank because he realized it was just something that he himself had put together had no power to minister to him and to his soul well as he was having that experience his wife uh, wandered into a courtyard of a building she'd never been in before and she suddenly realized she was in a Huguenot church and there was a man sitting at a desk there and for some reason that she couldn't explain she asked him if he had a bible and so he passed one to her she took it away she got home but she was afraid to tell her husband because he said that religion should never be mentioned in their home and he saw this book and said what is it she said it's a bible he took it from her went to his study he opened it and turned straight to the beatitudes and he began to read it and reread it he was absolutely riveted and then in the end, he said, this, this is the book that understands me. And he yielded his life to Jesus Christ and became a professor at Princeton Seminary to his dying day. That was his testimony. This, this book here, this is the book that understands me. And so unsafe friend here, if there are any here this morning, you're trying to make sense of your life. You're trying to make sense of this world. Why is this world the way it is? Why am I the way I am? The answer is in this book. This is the book that understands you, your sin condition, and also the remedy for your sin condition only through Jesus Christ and his shed blood at the cross. That's the only answer. It's in this book. The doctrine set forth in this book will bring you to him. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us in darkness, but you have given to us the light of your word. We thank you for its teaching. Thank you for its instruction. We thank you that this word helps us to know how to serve you, to love you, and to worship you. We thank you that this is the book that keeps us in paths of spiritual safety. This is the book that helps us in the midst of all of life's storms and adversity. And this is the book that helps us to give ourselves to spiritual activity. Oh Lord, we pray that you would uh, give us a greater, greater love for your word, for doctrine, that we would have that stability that comes from your word, and that we would be those who have a, a desire, hunger to grow more and more, that we may be those who 
truly do grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Please help us for these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, we do have some minutes left in our time to be able to take some questions and uh, also take some contributions and feedback as well. So if anyone has noted a question down, time to take it. Okay. Thank you. Not a question, but I've missed the third point on how to grow in doctrine. You talk by reading, listening to preaching, the third one. Mm. Oh, yeah. I did get the third one. The first one was reading. And then listening to preaching. Listening to preaching. The third is in studying the Word, studying the Bible. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Any questions or comments that we can take? <clears throat> I'm glad you are just reinforcing some of the things I was speaking about yesterday with this uh, group. My concern is for young people in our land. I'm not speaking about young people elsewhere. I live in Zambia and Osaka. They seem to be glued to the internet. Many of them are not um, that interested in doctrine. Um, several years ago at Osaka Baptist, uh, a number of young people, we loved doctrine. We read books. And many of them are now serving as elders, pastors. Um, I don't see that interest in young people speaking generally. There may be one or two who are interested. And we are aging. We will soon be gone. And uh, sometimes my fear is the church will be in the hands of people who are not grounded in doctrine. Um, what can we do, particularly to the young people, so that they become interested uh, in doctrine. Many of them don't even read. Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm not appearing uh, condemning, condemnatory, but uh, it's just the concern. What is it which we can do? Um, when I see young people, for instance, in our land, uh, in the Baptist circles, reformed Baptist circles, 30 years ago, young people were young people then, we loved doctrine. We drank doctrine. Um, uh, and uh, many of them, as I said, are serving the Lord. Um, so what can we do to make the young people interested uh, in doctrine? I know you mentioned, uh, but what practical things can we do, especially for us who are church leaders? The life of the church it can be uh, helpful for church leaders to have special meetings for young people where they can get together and uh, have fellowship with uh, other youngsters uh, sometime during the week where they can get together and, and enjoy each other's company and then during the course of an evening to uh, give a, a message or have a bible study or speak to them on some particular aspect of doctrine so to you know present it in a, in a way that uh, 
in a format that they will find helpful and uh, accessible. So things like that can be uh, very useful. Young people are always keen to get together and see their friends and then take up advantage of an opportunity like that to, uh, to then use it as a format for teaching. Um, you mentioned the internet. I think it's good uh, for churches because there is so much false teaching out there. You only have to go on YouTube and see some of the things that are out there. It's good for good, solid sound. Uh, Biblical churches to have a ministry out there so that people can come across good sermons when they're searching around uh, on YouTube. Um, and conferences like this, I think this is one of the aims of this conference, wasn't it? To uh, with lots of young people coming in to try and instill in them this excitement and interest in Christian doctrine. So I think get those sort of things and then pray. Most of all, isn't it? We need to pray. I mean, it's the heart. The heart is hard, and we need to join together as. Uh, leaders and as uh, members of the church praying for the young people they'll be delivered from the, the the glitter and the baubles of this age and start to have a real hunger for the truth uh, in God's word so those are just some uh, some pointers that I would give we still have any other ones um, I thank God that you alluded to the issue of um, uh, people missing evening services. I think that is also the challenge um, that we have here. And I hope that uh, as we've been challenged, that uh, part of the reason why there's a lot of false teaching that is spreading around is because a number of us don't see the evening service as something that we need. I hope it can also challenge us, but also in our own Christian lives, uh, we can take this more seriously and appreciate evening services as means for us to be grounded as Christians and also to grow as Christians. Uh, really, as we pray that um, we may become stronger and not be easily blown about, uh, that we take um, seriously all the opportunities that are offered uh, to us to ground ourselves in God's work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, dear brother for laboring to take us through this time of focusing and getting to know the importance of doctrine and really getting ourselves um, into God's mind for us when it comes to approaching doctrine. Uh, we'll take a few few moments, a few minutes. There are one or two things that may have dropped in your heart that you want to respond to God about. He did mention now about uh, asking the Lord and desiring that God would uh, shatter this 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 difficult heart. This that He would really bring up the interest for doctrine. So I'd like us to take a few few moments to bow our hearts, bow our heads, and talk to God concerning these things that we've heard. Our God and Father in heaven, is it not you who gives the delight that man needs to have for your word? So we pray that you will indeed incite this in us and will steer our hearts to truly hunger and thirst after the truth of your word. We may grow thereby, we may exercise ourselves thereby, and will be made firm even in times of trouble and trials and difficulties that you've promised that we will go through in this world. Do help us, O God, our Father, to respond in faith and in obedience to the things that we've learned this morning. We ask these things, trusting that you will indeed bless the words that you've given to us. Thank you, O God, for helping our dear pastor to labor in these words and be able to bring them to us. I pray that your blessings will also be with him. 
Thank you, O God, our Father, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we've come to the end of this session. Uh, the next session will begin by 11.30 and it will be on um, the study on Colossians by Pastor Paul Kayumba. But before then, we would have a tea break that will begin uh, when we dismiss now and then we'll reconvene in about 30 minutes here. So I encourage everyone to please stick to time and be um, fruitful, engage each other. That's one of the purposes and the reasons for this conference that we indeed fellowship with one another especially around the things that we are learning and we are hearing and may the lord bless our time together so thank you and uh, i'll see you in about 37 minutes thank you Chachi Kulu